Today, I'm going to address a very controversial topic to you, the rationale for including immune tolerant and low viral load patients in new drug trials. Nowadays, these groups of patients usually considered not for treatment. These are my disclosures. Immune tolerance phase is the characteristic first phase in patients who acquire HPV infection at infancy. It's characterized by high HPV DNA level, positive E engine, normal ALT, and minimal physiologic damage. So all guidelines recommend that we should observe these patients and not to start treatment. The latest ASLD guideline in, tw in 2018 actually clearly stated that there were no studies demonstrating antiviral is beneficial in reducing rates of liver cancer, cirrhosis, and liver-related death in patients with immune tolerance chronic hepatitis B. However, there are potential harms, including cost, antiviral drug side effects, and development of drug resistance, particularly in using earlier antiviral drugs, and this might outweigh the benefits. Therefore, ASLD recommends against antiviral therapy for adults with immune tolerant chronic hepatitis B. Recent years, there are increasing arguments towards treating patients in immune tolerance phase. First, we believe that high viral load is associated with high risk of liver cancer. Therefore, if we suppress HPV DNA, there is a chance that we can reduce the risk of liver cancer. There are also arguments towards earlier treatment of chronic hepatitis B because it might reduce HPV DNA integration into the host chromosome and it might also reduce the risk of liver cancer. In angle of public health, these patients have very high viral load. Treating these patients may reduce the rate of both horizontal and vertical transmission. And lastly, to define who has immune tolerance, who has not, may be a difficult task in some patients. And if you treat all patients, it may simplify treatment strategy to drive HPV elimination goal. However, treatment is not easy for these patients, and we nowadays do not have the right drug. So I'm showing you one of the pivotal study of treating immune tolerant patients, that is E positive patient with high HPV DNA, normal AOT, and in this study, patients were randomized to receive either tenofovir, uh, disoprostofemurate, uh, TDF, monotherapy, or TDF plus anthracitabine, FTC, as a combination therapy for four years. Response was defined as DNA less than 69 at the end of four years. If you look at the primary outcome measure, that is HPV DNA below 69, only 50% of patients on TDF monotherapy and 76% on combo therapy could achieve this endpoint. So most patients uh, uh, can have DNA suppressed, but still a significant proportion have DNA detectable. The more difficult endpoint to achieve is HPE and zero conversion. Almost 0% of patients could achieve this. In other words, when we stop therapy, almost all patients relapse. So TDF and even combination of TDF with FTC is not good enough to treat immune tolerant patients. There are uh, studies trying to use combo therapy, and I'm showing you one study combining antacovia with PET interferon combination in adults. So again, these patients have high viral load, AOT less than 1.5 times after you normal. Among 20 of them, none of them could achieve as loss. 4% achieved easy conversion at the end of treatment and also one year after stopping treatment, and none of them could have DNA less than 1,000 one year after stopping treatment. So again, combination therapy may not be good for adults. Similar studies have been reported in children. People believe that treating early may have a high success rate, but unfortunately for immune tolerant patients, it may not be the case. So 60 patients in this study, again combining antacovir with PEC interferon therapy at 
one year after stopping treatment, only 3% achieved S loss, and the same patient, of course, had ECU conversion and undetected HPV DNA, but all other patients had HPV DNA more than 1,000 one year after stopping treatment. So again, we do not have the right drug to treat these patients, and therefore these patients should be put in a clinical trial if we want to treat them. The second group of patients are patients with low viral load and we call low replicative phase. So this is a group of patients characterized by negative E antigen, positive E antibody, low HPV DNA, and low AOT and normal AOT level, and most guidelines recommend observation. This we sometimes call inactive carriers is primarily defined by HPV DNA level. And HPV DNA should be less than 2,000 IU per mil, as you can see from all the guidelines. And most of these patients should have normal AOT level repeatedly for a few times. The reason why HPV DNA is used as the key parameter to define inactive carrier is because of this very important study from Taiwan, the review HPV study. So they included more than 3,600 hepatitis B patients followed for more than 11 years. Most of these patients have negative E antigen, normal AOT, and most of them did not have liver cirrhosis. And in this study, they found that if HPV DNA is lower than four log uh, copies per mil, that is about 2,000 IU in the national units per mil, they have a low risk of XCC and a low risk of cirrhosis. Another Taiwanese study called the Radicate B study showing a very, very similar finding that is HPV DNA less than 2,000 IU per mil have a low risk of XCC. Further reduction of viral load will not reduce the risk of cancer. However, patients still can be classified into a higher HCC risk group and a lower HCC risk group among, the, among patients with DNA less than 2000 by HPSAG level. For those patients with HPSAG less than 1000, DNA less than 2000, they have a much lower risk than the patient with the same DNA level but higher SAG level, indicating the importance of HPSAG to, uh, to differentiate cancer risk. Going back to the review study, in another paper reporting a separate analysis of the review study, we can see that the lowest XCC risk was actually in patients with undetected HPV DNA and S loss. So S loss is a very important endpoint in these patients. So remember, these are untreated patients. These are natural, spontaneous S loss patients. And the lifetime risk is only 4% for liver cancer. If a patient has undetected DNA, but no S loss, that is positive HPSAG, the lifetime risk is about 1.5% uh, or five, five times higher. For E negative patient, positive DNA, no S loss, the lifetime cancer risk can be more than threefold higher than those with S loss. So S loss should be the ultimate goal of patients, even they are inactive carriers. There are a few studies trying to use PEG interferon to treat these inactive carriers and see how many of them can achieve S loss. However, the results vary from 3% to 94%. Although in a control group, none of the patients in the 4K series could achieve S loss. So it is very difficult to say whether PEG interferon is a good enough treatment for inactive carriers. When we look deeper into the design of these studies, most of these studies are from China, one study is from the Netherlands, and these are, most of them are prospective cohorts, open label studies, and they use PEG interferon for at least 48 weeks. The Netherlands study used it up, uh, used with adapovir or tenofovir combination, but achieved the lowest S loss rate. And one Chinese study uh, used PEG interferon up to 96 weeks. The key difference among these studies 
with the HPV DNA and the HPSH level of patients on recruitment, that is at the time we start PET interferon. For those studies who use PET to start PET interferon among patients with lower DNA, that is less than 100 and less than 200 IU per mil and lower HPSH level, that is less than 100 and even lower than 20 IU per mil, the success rate is much, much higher from 60 to 94%. On the other hand, if you treat patients with high viral load, the response rate is much worse. So based on all these data, where are we now today? For immunotolerant patients, we do have some rationale to treat, but most of these rationales are still arguments. We don't have hard, solid data suggesting that not treating these patients would increase the risk of liver cancer. So there is insufficient evidence to recommend treatment nowadays. And we know that what we have right now, that is PET interferon and NA, even when combining them, are not good enough. Therefore, these patients should be put into clinical trials. For patients with low viral load, they can have better prognosis after S0 clearance, but overall, they are a low risk group to observe. So there's no hurry to treat these patients, but it's good to push them one step further to lose surface antigen, and you know that they can have an even lower cancer risk. PET interferon has some success, particularly in patients with low HPV DNA and low HPSAG. However, because PET interferon has a side effect in regards to injection, it is good to have new drugs to treat these patients, and therefore they should also be put into clinical trials. So for the direction of new drug trials in these two groups of patients, for immunotolerant patients, we should look for an effective drug regimen. We know that probably it is not a single drug. It's probably a combination of drugs. We always hope for S0 clearance. It's a functional cure. It's almost a universal endpoint for all treatment trials. But however, because this is a very hard to treat group, I think E0 conversion can be an acceptable endpoint during the process of drug development. For patients of low viral load, these are low risk group. We should look for a safe and effective drug regimen. So safety is important because even if you don't treat, they are not having a very high risk of liver cancer and preferably the treatment is of shorter duration. From the lessons of PET interferon, we learned that patient selection is a concern. So we select patients with lower SH level, lower viral load, probably we can have a high rate of success. And of course, S0 conversion should be the endpoint for this group of patients in new clinical trials. With that, thank you very much for your attention.